Dr. Peter Buteneff teaches courses in ancient and modern theology and spirituality at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary, where he is the Professor of Systematic Theology and Kulik Professor of Sacred Arts. He has actually been working on a new book, exploring the coming together between the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox Churches. So, Dr. Buteneff, we're especially glad that you're willing to speak with us today. I'm so happy to be here, John. So tell us about your coming book, first of all. Well, thanks for asking. Uh, I think the book was motivated by a, a question that I hear a lot when I talk about the coming together of our of our church families. You know, I, I teach at St. Vladimir's Seminary, as you mentioned. I've taught there 23 years. And uh, one of the blessings of our seminary is that we have students from both church families uh, very fully integrated into the student life and into the whole theological life of the school. And I've taught a seminar a couple of times on the coming together of our churches. And uh, the question comes up, and it's a very reasonable question. And the question is, uh, are we smarter than the fathers? Do we think that we know better than the fathers who anathematized the Monophysites uh, back in the day. Uh, who do we think we are? So as I say, it's not an unreasonable question, but I think my book is, is an attempt to um, explore that question. And, you know, the outset, of course, we're not smarter, we're not wiser, we're not more spiritual than the fathers, we're not more loving than the fathers, all we had to do was love each other. Um, but we have more information. And uh, what, uh, you know, I, I've kind of pretty far along in the book right now, and what it, I seem to be finding is that um, what we're doing with the modern dialogue is something that is very patristic. And that is, you know, when new information comes to light, when conversations happen about what did you mean by that term, the fathers reconsider their judgments. Uh, this happens in the fourth century. St. Athanasius asks uh, people what they mean by hypostasis, what they mean by usia, and he changes his mind about their church status on the basis of their answers to that question. Um, the Cappadocians are, are, are so keen on this mutual understanding, like genuine understanding, not just a war of slogans and terms. Um, and then, uh, you know, another example, uh, fathers who were received or bishops who were received at the Fourth Ecumenical Council, their writings were anathematized in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. You know, so uh, even at ecumenical councils, fathers uh, reconsider on the basis of new perspectives and new information. And so what I hope that we're doing in the modern dialogue process is uh, finding that patristic mind that we're always talking about, you know, being patristic a a as much as we can, affiliating ourselves with the fathers. Um, so that's what the book is aiming to show, like by looking back at that period of the ecumenical councils and um, what went on. So in your book, you would open the door to ongoing dialogue, which has been happening, but to even look more seriously at new information and what perhaps we have learned, not that we know better than the fathers, but that perhaps there uh, is a, had been misunderstanding or somehow a miscommunication in the past. Would that be a good way to put it? Uh, yeah, it would be a good way to put it. And it's also, uh, you know, we're looking at, at centuries of profound uh, turbulence and uh, profound distress because uh, nobody enjoys schism and disunion and ecclesiastical battles. Uh, if you do enjoy them, you might have a problem. Uh, but you know, it's 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 a time of of that sometimes the dust needs to settle, and sometimes the dust needs a thousand years <laughs> to settle, and uh, you know. I think already there was a hunch back then that, that the, the word nature, thesis, was being used in different ways. Uh, but some of the other repercussions about who gets anathematized, you know, who gets to be a saint, 
um, these questions sometimes got clouded in the political turbulence. And I think we have a, a clearer perspective on some of them. Again, not smarter, just perspective. Let's dive into that event a little bit deeper as you have done this research and study working on the book. Can you give some specifics about where some of the misunderstanding may have taken place and uh, what can we learn from that today as we continue our dialogues? Sure. Um, I think it's, it's pretty common to focus on the word nature in Greek, feces, uh, as, as one of the sort of key areas here, you know, um, the word diophysite means to nature, you know, Chalcedon Chalcedonian Christians profess uh, Christ known in two natures, um, and miaphysite Christians, we can get into that term later, um, profess uh, a faith in Christ with one incarnate nature, one divina human nature. And so uh, a lot of the sifting out that has had to happen in, in the centuries is, uh, are these two uses of nature uh, both acceptable? Now, the Fifth Ecumenical Council actually says, yes, both terms are acceptable. The one incarnate nature is acceptable and the two natures is acceptable. Our own Ecumenical Council says that. We often forget the Fifth Ecumenical Council because we're so obsessed by the Fourth. But um, so you know, it, but it's a matter of of finding the implications of what the Fifth Ecumenical Council meant when it said that you could use both these terms. And if it said that, why why didn't it kind of seal the deal right then and there in the sixth century? It didn't, and that's partly because uh, by that time the the political. Uh, and ecclesiastical divisions were so sharp and clouded by persecutions and 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 other things. But um, the more we look into that term, what it meant, even to post-Chalcedonian uh, theologians like Severus, whom the non-Chalcedonians venerate as a saint, and whom the Eastern Orthodox, uh, in some contexts, anathematize. Well, what did he mean by feces? That's an entirely different question. And uh, once we decide, once we care enough to drill deeper into what he actually meant, then, you know, some of the leading patristic scholars we have all agree. You know, Meyendorf, Lauf, Baer, you know, Galitzin, all agree that Severus was teaching the same thing as Cyril of Alexandria. You know, so that's a new insight, I think, uh, that we do well to learn from. That kind of brings up my next question. As you've done your research, what, uh, what were your observations in terms of obstacles? Uh, certainly, we can look at our modern day scholars and talk about uh, how they uh, read Severus. And mm -hmm. what, what, what obstacles remain that we really do need to take seriously? Uh, you know, it's some of that question can be answered by research, but in a way, I think of some of the chief obstacles as being uh, in our perspective, our outlook, and uh, our habits, <laughs> the habit of division. Uh, we are quite used to being out of communion with each other. We're used to the status quo. And uh, furthermore, as, as Orthodox, we have an often healthy impulse to resist uh, diversity in uh, theological formulations, in liturgical formulations, in the veneration of saints. Um, that can be a healthy impulse, but it can also be a, a paralyzing impulse. And uh, so when I think of obstacles, it's, it's at that level. It's, it's uh, so many of us either don't see what the problem is. Let's just continue in our happy way. We uh, greet each other with a hug uh, at uh, inter-Orthodox meetings, and then we send each other on our merry way and we don't commune with each other. Um, 
if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, and then the other mentality is to say that it is very broke and it needs fixing. Uh, there is a there is a wound here um, in the body that that needs healing. And so uh, <clears throat> when I was speaking about a resistance to change, resistance to diversity, uh, we always have to ask the question of when is diversity uh, unhealthy? and involve uh, some either deeply problematic practice or problematic teaching theology. But when is there an absolutely fruitful and healthy diversity? As there was in the patristic era, the conciliar era, there were different emphases. You know, Athanasius and the Cappadocians, fully orthodox, our dear and revered fathers in God, but they, they had different emphases in how they spoke about Christ even, uh, that just depended on who they were dialoguing with, etc. Fully acceptable diversity. Liturgically, there was a much wider diversity of rites in play uh, in the uh, early Christian centuries and up to the 5th, 6th, 7th century than we have today. And so we got really used to uh, a, a certain fixity of liturgy that is in many ways a blessing for us. You know, we, we, we know exactly what we're doing, where we are, uh, no matter where we are in the Eastern Orthodox world. Uh, but would we be ready to embrace a greater liturgical diversity that existed in antiquity? You know, uh, those are some of the obstacles. Yeah. Uh, and sure, you could get more specific on those questions, but I think it's, it's, it's a question of uh, outlook and perspective. And I, I, finally on this, John, I would say um, once one is committed to genuinely exploring this, once one is committed to the possibility of enlarging the tent <laughs> of who we consider to be uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ in communion, uh, once that becomes the goal uh, many of the obstacles uh, become less thorny, less dire. So here we are some 1,500 years uh, later after Chalcedon. Theologians on both sides, particularly in recent decades, have had theological debates and dialogue. And I just wonder if you sense that we are getting closer that some of the issues are uh, not uh, kind of brushed over and downplayed, but better explained, uh, better uh, f formulated. Now, I guess what I'm getting at is uh, what has happened recently, and has there been progress in your in your mind? I know you you studied this. Sure. Uh yeah, I mean, the, the the very tangible dialogue is is one that has taken place over um, eight meetings, you know, from the 1960s to the 1990s, uh, four unofficial meetings and then four official meetings, you know, official meaning the participants were a appointed by the hierarchy of, of, of each of the churches, you know, kind of formally. Uh, so there was a, a, a dialogue that is on the whole very practical and also on the whole very realistic. It doesn't sweep issues under the rug. It speaks about councils. It speaks about counting the councils. It speaks about theses, <laughs> one nature, two natures. It, it really gets in there. It speaks about saints. Um, and uh, the dialogue, in a way, was so radically positive in its conclusions that I think it surprised and scared a lot of the churches. Uh, it's like, wait a minute, we didn't actually send you guys out there to bring us together. <laughs> uh, but lo and behold, uh, that's what they did. And so uh, the reception of that dialogue, which is now in its like 30 plus year period, uh, these things do take time, you know, John. I mean, the, the, the ecumenical councils took decades to be received. Uh, but, uh, y you know, there, there are, are reactions of 
real resistance to that dialogue, such as from Mount Athos. There are, uh, there's a great welcome of the dialogue, but um, only in recent years there are attempts to really begin to restart the dialogue. Um, and different churches are doing it in different ways. Um, the Moscow Patriarchate is um, choosing to dialogue one-on-one -on -one with different Oriental churches, with the Coptic Church, with the Armenian Church, etc., uh, which is, a, I think, a fully good and realistic approach as well. Um, and then there are kind of more pan-Orthodox uh, kind of questions. I, I, I kind of was hoping that the, the Great Council in Crete uh, in 2016 might take up this issue, but that was... Yeah, that was mentioned by another one of our guests, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they decided to talk about fasting instead and stuff like that. Mm. Um, right on. Uh, uh, so, yeah, no, I, I think that uh, what I'm sensing is that the more, well, you know, it's even like what you are doing with this uh, documentary, this exploration here at Ancient Faith Radio is is a really important sign uh, that, that there may be a greater readiness on the part of uh, not only the clergy and hierarchs, but also the people. The people are, are ready hmm. to um, to come together. I would imagine one of the challenges, and you kind of referenced this, uh, is the diversity of traditions in various locales, even in the Eastern Orthodox Church, obviously. We have the Greeks, the Russians, the Romanians, the Antiochians, etc. And on the Oriental Orthodox side, you have the Eritreans, the Indian Malankara Church, the uh, Coptic, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, in your understanding, um, it, are there theological differences between the various Oriental Orthodox churches? Have you sensed any of that? Um, well, you know, uh, as you've just raised it, not necessarily just theologically, but in, in a lot of ways, the, the group that we've now come to call a family of Oriental Orthodox churches, I mean, that concept of that as a body didn't exist before the 1960s. You know, uh, the family of Oriental churches uh, came into being as as part of the dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and I think that in itself is significant because it points to, uh, you know, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the autocephalous churches that together constitute the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, has a much uh, tighter rubric for unity, you know, the ecumenical patriarchate, and then you know the the, the patriarchates and autocephalous churches uh, that are in communion with each other, uh, and that has more or less existed. You know, churches have accrued over the centuries, but it's existed for for centuries. Uh, the Oriental churches. Ethiopian, Coptic, Armenian, Eritrean, uh, Syrian, Malankara, uh, and the, the different families within them are a much more diverse group with, with, without a kind of uh, principle of coherence that unites them. Uh, there is no kind of uh, first among equals church uh, that would claim primacy among that family of churches, for example. Uh, which also means that there's not as great a uh, theological coherence other than the fact that all of these churches are utterly bound to a very deep sense of patristic fidelity, hmm. patristic and liturgical fidelity. And uh, the beautiful thing is that, that one can sense this when one attends their liturgies, when one has theological conversations, you, you sense that you are talking with sisters and brothers, you know, very close ones, and that you are praying with sisters and brothers, very close ones. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, uh, the, the other thing I would say is that there are, to be honest, fewer, uh, maybe per capita, I don't know, but fewer uh, kind of book writing and uh, 
high-profile theologians that can be found uh, to to discern their um, theological agreements and disagreements. Um, so, so that's an issue is in kind of the role that kind of academic theology plays in in each of our churches. Yeah, I found it interesting. Someone pointed out a website that's really very well maintained called Scooch, the Standing Conference of Oriental Orthodox Churches. Have you seen that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, no, it's it it's excellent. And and Scooch, uh, which was the counterpart to Scoba, mm-hmm. uh, uh, now the Assembly of Bishops in the USA, but um, it it's another sign of this greater unity in the search for coherence but between the oriental churches uh, it's a very positive thing mm. well we referenced some terminology earlier and i think this would be a good time for us to learn uh from you and your research uh how to understand the differences between a monophysite or monophysite a neophysite and then uh, kind of related, uh, but a few hundred, couple hundred years later, neophyletism. Can you help us with those terms? Sure. Um, I'll just briefly talk about the last one. Monothelitism was a um, 6th, 7th century heresy that taught that Christ had only one will. And um, so uh, one of the things, by the way, that the modern dialogue showed us the the 20th century dialogue was that the oriental churches have no problem confessing that christ has both a human and a divine will two wills you know so uh that was one of the uh joys of the of the modern dialogue is to say oh you also believe that there are two wills oh you also believe that uh christ is consubstantial both with god the father and with us as son of mary as son of the father um uh, oh, you also anathematize uh, Eutyches, uh, who, who who taught that Christ's human nature was swallowed up by the divine. Oh, you know, this is a great discovery. So, um, monophysite for centuries was kind of the going term to describe a very broad swath of uh, of of those who taught that Christ had one nature. Uh, the problem with the term monophysite is that it could describe um, heretics like Eutyches. Uh, you might call it Eutychian monophysitism, or you could call it radical monophysitism, uh, who basically taught that Christ had no humanity at all, no human nature at all. Uh, but then uh, monophysites used to also describe what you might call moderate monophysites, severian monophysites, etc., who taught that Christ was absolutely one with God and one with us. He has full humanity. Um, this is why he can say things like, I thirst, I hunger, um, ask where Lazarus is laid, etc. Miaphysite now comes into play as, as a much more accurate term to describe the non-heretical monophysites. Why miaphysite? Well, because it follows St. Cyril of Alexandria's formula. St. Cyril was a miaphysite. <laughs> he taught miaphysis to theologus sarcomeni, one nature of God, the Word incarnate. Uh, that one nature is a divino human nature. Uh, it uh, it it is both divine and human, right? So it's it's a way of maintaining the integrity and and uh, singularity of Christ's person. He is one person uh, who is both divine and human. That's his nature to be both God and man. You know. So that's how Cyril of Alexandria, our common saint expresses it, miaphysis. So miaphysite is a more accurate term, and it also makes it less likely for people to just, with a very broad stroke, say, oh, monophysite heretics, you know, it's a very common uh, approach today among people who like to use the word heretic. Uh, the monophysites are all heretics, and with that broad stroke, they have eliminated, you know, fully Cyriline 
Christians, may I assign Christians. So let's, uh, you know, the, the movement now is to say, let's use our terms carefully, like the fathers did, and say, may I to refer to the Oriental Orthodox who teach with Cyril one nature and use the word monophysite to speak of Eutyches and uh, the heresy of, uh, of that heresy. So uh, should we be comfortable taking on that label ourselves as a meophysite? Um, that's a beautiful question. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we absolutely uphold the uh, theological definition of the Council of Chalcedon. There's absolutely no repudiating that. And uh, that definition says that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is known in two natures. And then you have the qualifiers, you know, without change, without confusion, without division, without separation. But he is known in two natures. Um, so we are di diophysite in that sense in that we are Chalcedonian. When you look uh, a century later to the next ecumenical council, which says, yes, you can also use the Miaphysite formula, properly qualified, you know, Miaphysis, but without confusion. Um, but I think we are primarily known uh, for our adherence to Chalcedon, and therefore we are diophysites who admit Miaphysite um, formulations as well, because we also believe in the fifth ecumenical council. Oh, Sorry, that a long kind of answer to your question. No, no, no I, I, I kind of slipped that in on you too. So, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, in terms of the way um, these relationships play out in different parts of the world. Uh, have you seen or heard about differences, say, in the Middle East or in Egypt or in you know, parts of the mother countries where the relationships actually play out a little differently than they do here in North America? Yeah, um, I think that in the Middle East, uh, there are two really important factors that make the impulse more friendly towards union. One of those factors is the tragic fact of, of, of Christianity being such a small minority uh, in the region, uh, in a giant uh, Islamic majority. Uh, and so in the face of that situation, it's a, it's a dwindling Christian minority. Um, Divisions and factionalism is like a luxury that they just can't afford, if you want to put it that way. Uh, they remain formally out of communion, but there are uh, a number of official pastoral agreements that have to do with uh, marriages between Eastern and Oriental Christians, uh, how communion may be received in each other's churches, uh, how to deal with baptism, marriage, funerals, etc. You know, where the rubber hits the road in, in, in lived life. Uh, and you have people living shoulder to shoulder and marrying each other. Uh, the, the, the relationships tend to be closer. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean theology gets swept under the rug. It simply means that... Uh, the impulse is towards union. Then, pastoral approach. Yeah, it's a pastoral approach. Uh, again, that doesn't ignore theology. Yeah. Uh, in in places like, uh, well, India, where the vast minority of uh, of the Orthodox are Oriental, uh, there's perhaps less of a pressing need to reunite uh, with the Eastern in a country like Greece or uh, in the Slavic countries where the face of Orthodoxy is pretty much exclusively Eastern Orthodox, uh, you know, they don't see what the problem is, you know, maybe closer to Armenia they do, uh, but uh, 
you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, like I said earlier. Uh, in America, you have pockets of places where there is a, a very close collaboration um, it, where where our churches are often side by side with each other in some localities. Uh, in the blessing, uh, as I was saying, at St. Vladimir's Seminary, where a large percentage of our students are uh, Oriental Orthodox, Coptic, and Armenian especially, uh, you know, the the... Again, the I keep using that word impulse. The impulse is to um, be together in as in as as much as it's possible. Um, we are not uh, in formal communion with each other, and therefore, uh, at our seminary, which is obviously a very visible and an important place, uh, we're not allowed to. We we do not share intercommunion, um, uh, and. It, you know, when we are at liturgy and the Malankara and Coptic and other stu students and Armenian students are standing in the back and not receiving communion, it's an extremely painful thing. Should be. And yeah, exactly, John. It should be painful. We need to be familiar with that pain uh, because that pain needs to uh, motivate our, our, our action. Mm. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. Mm. So, what would the Oriental Orthodox churches need to change uh, in their theology or practice in order to qualify for communion with the Eastern Orthodox Church? Um, so, I, th I think the the principles along which the, the dialogue has been happening is that uh, it's not like the the Eastern who are the the judge and the Orientals who have to pass a purity test. I think that's that's one that's one way many Eastern Orthodox would like to see it. Oh well, we can be in communion if they all simply repent of their error and join our church. And uh, you know, in in some that 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 would be a simple solution that would fly in the face of 1500 years of of the building of identity among the oriental churches uh as for who and what they are uh so it, it's not like they have to do something to qualify uh for communion it it is that the dialogue has to reach a place where both families uh, recognize the apostolic orthodox faith in each other's theology and liturgy. It has to be mutual recognition. And then uh, one can hope for a restored communion. Now, uh, to, to answer, I think, some of the things you might be asking within your, your question, uh, they, uh, you know, actually two days ago in, in our church, we celebrated the feast of Pope Leo of Rome, <laughs> uh, who is uh, a heretic for most of the Oriental churches. Yeah. Uh, they commemorate at every liturgy uh, Dioscorus and Severus as fathers among the fathers. So, uh, I think what would need to happen is not necessarily that we would have to start venerating Dioscorus and Severus as saints, but we would have to uh, stop anathematizing them as heretics. And, and we would aim on their side with toward people. Exactly. They don't have to suddenly have St. Leo Day, <laughs> but they, they can't consider him a heretic. And uh, that would have to be done on the basis of historical study, like we are all doing, that show that Dioscorus was never formally anathematized as a heretic until he just got swept up into a kind of guilt by association with Eutyches. But he, he repudiates Eutyches, so he is not a heretic. Neither the one that didn't show up for the council and then was punished because of that is... Uh, yeah, the, 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 his... The deposition at Chalcedon was was disciplinary, okay. and uh, and even later meetings make that really really clear. Uh, uh, so, 
that's just an example of the kind of things we have to do together is just stop you know there is a history of of lifting other anathemas uh, once an anathema is proclaimed um that does not necessarily make it an eternal uh, infallible reality you know uh the the theological definitions of the ecumenical councils is one thing the acts and the uh, canons are another thing so i think that that's you, where you get the anathema sort of uh issue coming into play it's interesting in one of my conversations for our documentary and talking with a scholar from the oriental churches uh he said that uh chalcedon undid what ephesus accomplished which i thought was was interesting and uh and i went on to ask him and i'm going to ask you now well do the eastern orthodox christians somehow have to repudiate chalcedon in order for there to be communion uh is that what would be required of of us which mm. i don't think is going to happen uh but uh, i'd love your thoughts on that yeah, yeah. well for one uh, can't happen won't happen <laughs> um, to repudiate the the theological definition of Chalcedon is uh, is unthinkable. Uh, what I think, you know, when you look to the, I keep mentioning the Fifth Ecumenical Council, happened a century after Chalcedon. The Fifth Ecumenical Council, it kind of serves as a reader's guide to Chalcedon, <laughs> and it says this is how we understand Chalcedon. And it and it understands Chalcedon through thoroughly in a Cyril of Alexandria way, in a way that rules out any whiff of uh, Nestorianism. You know the the idea that Chalcedon was a betrayal of Cyril, that Chalcedon was a pro Nestorian council. Well, uh, one could read that definition and say, oh, gee, in two natures, that sounds Nestorian, okay? But if you, if you rule out that reading very, very carefully, as the Eastern Orthodox Church did, uh, then, and especially then, Chalcedon becomes uh, an utterly uh, brilliant piece of, 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 of our cherished theology. And so it's a matter of inviting each other to to see it in this way and to read it in this way. Um, I think the the non Chalcedonians feel that Chalced that the Chalcedonian definition and the whole council was a kind of a betrayal in that it uh, it received uh, into communion um, people whom uh, who were suspect as Nestorians and who a century later were indeed condemned. Uh, and it uh, welcomed the Tome of Leo, which is a whole complicated text that needs its own proper reading. Uh, so, uh, and, it, uh, and it deposed uh, Dioscorus, whom they saw as a hero. So for, for these and other reasons, the whole event left a very sour taste in the mouth. But as far as how to read it as, uh, to see Chalcedon as, a back step after Ephesus, um, one has to read Chalcedon through Cyril, as as we do. Mm. Yeah. So, would you go far as so far as to say that um, the Fifth Ecumenical Council modified the Fourth, or somehow explains it? I'm just wondering where should the dialogue begin with the Fourth or the Fifth? Sure, um, the Fifth. Ecumenical Council explains the fourth. It doesn't modify it in the slightest. Uh, and I think where, where, where we begin is with uh, Nicaea and Constantinople, you know, and, and the Nicene Creed. Uh, when we think of the ecumenical councils, there are no two councils that have anything like the weight of those first two. And the creed that they produced which we sing or recite at every liturgy and as part of our personal prayers in some cases, um, 
that is the bedrock of of our dogma. Uh, nothing else that comes afterwards has the same kind of impact. Does anybody read or recite uh, Ephesus, Chalcedon? Does anybody know the 15 anathemas of the Fifth Ecumenical Council? You know, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that they're nothing. <laughs> they are our cherished theology. But as far as uh, the bedrock of our dogma, it is the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, which is the definition of faith at Nicaea and then uh, added to, and in some cases, slightly revised at uh, Constantinople. But so that late when I'm thankful for uh, the smarter minds and more trained theological minds that do care about this and have been participating in these dialogues over the last several decades. And I'm encouraged to see uh, some fruit uh, coming from that. But let's talk now uh, about the laity and what our role can be. Obviously, we want to pray for unity. That should be uh, the utmost uh, prayer of our lips, that God would uh, bless us with the fruit of unity in his Son. Uh, but what can, what else can we do uh, in getting to know or understanding uh, our uh, brothers and sisters in the Oriental non-Chalcedonian churches? Yeah, that's a lovely question, and I'm glad that you begin with, with prayer. Uh, all of this is uh, the Lord's to accomplish through us, and uh, may we be doing His will uh, in the work that we do um, with with reverence, and may our priorities be the right ones. Uh, I think that uh, as uh, lay people and as institutions, uh, I think we can start with just familiarizing ourselves with each other a little bit. Uh, having conversations, kindling friendships, humanizing the other. That's such an important thing. Uh, and uh, I'll say again, in the contexts where uh, where I've worked kind of side by side, Eastern Oriental uh, Christians together in, um, in the inter-Orthodox scene, in the ecumenical scene at, at St. Vladimir's Seminary, uh, uh, Sankt Ignatios uh, Theological College in Sweden is, is very, very united in, in their theological education and in their community. It's in such places where um, a lot of the work towards unity is happening, uh, not among, and it's not necessarily only because they're dialoguing theologically, it's because they're eating in the same refectory. It's because they go to each other's uh, services. They don't commune tragically but uh, so it, it's humanizing the other getting to know the other and beginning to understand that the other is um, perhaps <laughs> one with us uh, and that uh, like I keep saying the tent is bigger than we think uh, so with that I mean uh, especially where appropriate in the Middle East a common witness a common mission a common word to uh, society, a prophetic word, Christian word uh, to society that is spoken in common. Uh, we've witnessed uh, what happens where persecution is shared. The Coptic martyrs, uh, the 40 Coptic martyrs of ISIS uh, had such a profound impact regardless of whether you were Eastern or Oriental Orthodox, because somehow instinctively we felt they are us, and their martyrdom is a, is a Christian victory. Uh, you know, when you have these two Christian bishops kidnapped, uh, we still don't know where they are. Uh, the brother of Patriarch John X and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Johanna uh, Ibrahim uh, Gregorius, uh, from the Syrian church, they were in a car together. Yeah, trying to look to end up together, you know. So it's, uh, you know, persecution uh, is one of those very sobering places where we come together. Uh, 
but let's also come together in in joy and in proclamation to the world and in theological education you know yeah and saint vladimir's has certainly led the way on that and even saint tikon's as well and uh, Father Chad Hatfield is one of our panelists on this documentary, and we'll be uh, talking more in depth about that uh, at St. Yes. Latimer's. Yes, we have a, he'll tell you about our sister agreement for, for decades with St. Nurses Armenian Theological Seminary. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as we conclude, uh, Dr. Butenev, any additional thoughts that you'd like to share on this topic? I think I've... Uh, I've probably exhausted <laughs> you <laughs> and our listeners with uh, with what I've had to say. Uh, yeah, been very enlightening, and I really appreciate your time and uh, the research. When is your book coming out? Well, um, well, our conversation is taking place in, in mid February, twenty twenty four. For the record, <laughs> um, if if it comes out in a year, I'd be really delighted. Um, well. We'll look for it. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Peter Budhanev teaches courses in ancient and modern theology and spirituality at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. He's a professor of systematic theology and the Kulik Professor of Sacred Arts, working on a book right now on the relationships and dialogue between Oriental and Eastern Orthodox Christians. Dr. Budhanev, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John.